coming up on Extraordinary Faith. We'll show you the best of classic sacred art, architecture, liturgy, and music. In this episode, we'll take you to Windsor, Ontario, Canada, where we'll visit the first Latin Mass community to be founded in the Detroit area after Vatican II. We'll talk with two priests who have taken unusual paths to celebrating the extraordinary form. We'll listen in on the St. Benedict Tridentine Community Choir, and we'll meet some dogs who have learned to obey orders given to them in Latin. Cross the border into Canada with us on Extraordinary Faith. Hello, I'm Alex Began, welcoming you to Extraordinary Faith, a program that travels far and wide to bring you the best in the world of Catholic traditions. Today we're coming to you from my hometowns, the dual cities of Detroit, Michigan and Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Much like San Francisco, St. Louis and Philadelphia, where a body of water separates two metro areas, the Detroit River is the dividing line between these two cities. The twist here is that they're in two different countries, but those of us who live here think of them as suburbs of one another. We'll start our tour with a visit to the original Extraordinary Form Mass community in this region, the St. Benedict Tridentine community at Windsor's historic Assumption Church. There, we'll meet up with an old friend of mine who was recently ordained to the priesthood. We're standing in front of the Rosary Chapel at one of North America's most historic churches, Assumption Church in Windsor. Assumption Parish was founded in 1728 to serve early French settlers, while the main church building opened in 1845. For many years, Assumption served as the home to the oldest Latin mass community in Windsor and Metro Detroit, the St. Benedict Tridentine community. St. Benedict has been a fruitful source of vocations to the priesthood over the years with some interesting stories to tell. When most people think of priests who come to offer the traditional Latin Mass, they think of young men who enter the seminary at a relatively young age and progress through the traditional seminary system. But today we're joined by two priests who took different paths to celebrating the Latin Mass. First is Father Joe Tuskowitz, who was ordained to the priesthood only two weeks before we shot this segment, and Father Peter Hritzik, a bi-ritual priest from the Eastern Ukrainian Rite. We'll start with Father Joe. Father Joe, before you became a priest, tell us what your original career was. Well, I spent uh, 30 years in the advertising agency business, and uh, being from Detroit, that meant uh, advertising and marketing cars and trucks and uh, so I started at the low low end of the business worked my way up over the years and uh, during the course of my career the company moved me to various places from Detroit which was where our home office was based so Atlanta LA Chicago and then I eventually took a job in uh, in Japan as regional director for the Asia-Pacific region, traveling all that vast uh, geography out there, and then returned to, uh, to the home office in Detroit. Well, after a career like that, you got a chance to see the world. You were a high-flying executive. What made you decide on the priesthood? Well, you know, it was a calling that I thought I heard as a child. Um, I went to a Catholic grade school, and I was an altar server, and um, in the late 60s, when I got out of grade school, things were kind of uh, crazy in the culture at that time, and I thought it would be more fun to uh, make TV commercials. So I pursued that, and uh, I guess got to be pretty good at it, and uh, ended up on a 30-year career. The, the call never completely went away. I just tried to ignore it and work through it. and. Um, then later on in life, I started to hear the call again when I was paying more attention to it. Father Peter, you wear a number of hats around this area. Tell us about your various responsibilities. 
Yes, unlike Father Joe, I had a much more traditional uh, entry into the priesthood. I've been ordained for 31 years. Um, I am the associate pastor at the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which is an Eastern Rite Church. Besides being the chaplain here at St. Benedict's Trentine Community, and I've been uh, working in the Diocese of London since 1995. Uh, along with that, I'm also uh, working in administration of the Catholic High School as a vice principal. Um, so my second career began after ordination. Now you were known to hang around in the congregation in Latin Masses before we roped you in into being a celebrant. Tell us what attracted you to the traditional Mass. Well, I think what, what, uh, what was going on is the fact that I had grown up uh, serving both in the Eastern Rite and, and in the Roman Rite uh, as a student down the road at Assumption High School, uh, at, besides my own parish, and having gone and uh, studied at St. Michael's in Toronto with the Brazilians coming back. Uh, and I was always interested in, in, after seeing the architectural patrimony of so many of our churches in, in Europe especially, and listening to the musical patrimony, the, the gift of music that over the centuries that was bequeathed and, and exists within the church, to see how it all fits together. I think it was really a, an interest to see how all of the components fit together in, a, in the traditional uh, Latin Mass and to see how it's built. Uh, and knowing that it's a little bit less linear uh, than the, the revised liturgy. And so that was basically my interest. So I came really as an interested spectator to see how all the components fit together. And I was amazed when I came uh, seeing the precision of the, the servers, listening to the choir, which was just magnificent. Uh, this was at uh, St. Michael's Church at that time. Um, and I was, from that time on, uh, very interested in, in the traditional Latin Mass. Father Joe, you came to our Tridentine Mass scene here in Detroit by joining our team of altar servers that goes from church to church. What about the Tridentine Mass captured your imagination? Well, you know, I actually stumbled upon the extraordinary form quite by accident. Um, I, after I moved back to Detroit from Japan, I was kind of looking for a home parish, and I joined a parish that was part of a three-parish cluster that would eventually be merged into one parish. And um, I attended the, the um, ordinary form of the Mass, and the, the pastor kept encouraging the parishioners from all three churches to feel welcome to go to any of the three if there was a more convenient Mass time or something like that. And that actually happened one time where the church down the street had an earlier mass that I needed to go to. So I went down there and it turns out it was the extraordinary form. So um, at first I was, I mean, I had heard that it was going on there. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. And um, I was a little disoriented at first, but I thought it was beautiful. And that kind of was that until weeks, months later uh, same thing again, I had to go to an earlier Mass and I went to that place. Well, I would say by about th the third time of doing that, I was really felt drawn to what was going on, the, the beauty of it, the solemnity, the dignity. And I also happened to notice that among the many altar servers, there were a couple older guys. And I thought, maybe my altar serving days are not over. And I went and talked to you, actually, where the MC in charge of training altar servers. The pastor sent me over to you, and I got trained and became an altar server. And I think that even though I had been already discerning my vocation at that point, I think it really helped being in the sanctuary um, and serving. I think it really helped confirm uh, my discernment process and maybe even accelerate it a little bit. So it was uh, very influential. I remember a comment you made to me many years ago that you were also influenced by the piety of the people in the congregation. That's very true. Um, when I first started um, serving and got to start to meet the people who were coming to the, uh, to the Mass there, I was, um, I was just astounded at their piety, the way they lived their faith in their lives and how seriously they took it. And I think that was a big inspiration 
for me, you know, somebody who was beginning to seriously, you know, discern a call to the priesthood, I think they were a big uh, influence on that, pro you know, in that process. Father Peter, we've heard time and again from people attending our masses for the first time that they are touched by the music program, and music has obviously been an influence in your life. Uh, what is the role of music in the liturgy, especially in the Sunday liturgy? I think the, um, the role of music is, is really, really uh, a very essential uh, part of the uh, liturgy. Um, I think it is that which um, elevates the, the practice. Uh, and, and I think what it does is it, it connects us to the, all of the apostolic rites, which have placed so much emphasis from antiquity on the role of music, uh, whether it is the uh, particular chanting that's done, uh, whether it is the responses between the priest and the celebrant and, and the people. Uh, in all the different ways, I think it heightens the, the level of the liturgy. Um, and I'd have to say that this program that we have here at St. Benedict's is um, exemplary. Uh, in the dedication and work that uh, they've done. They put a lot of time and effort in. Um, it is a very beautiful uh, program. Uh, it certainly uh, transforms the liturgy and raises it up in a way that I think that is meant to, to be. Uh, we know from all of the documents uh, from the Second Vatican Council which speak about music and the importance of music in the Mass, uh, that it is a, 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 almost a language in it of its own and it raises the spiritual dimension of the Mass, and it's very, very important, and we're very lucky here at St. Benedict's to have the community, the music uh, program that we have. Many Catholics nowadays have little or no exposure to the Eastern Rites. What is the role of music in the Ukrainian Rite? Well, traditionally, in all of the Eastern Rites, all of the services are sung. Uh, they're only not sung if we have a lack of, of a singer. Uh, but even if we have one singer, then the services are sung, and it's just simply a natural part. And one can go and hear uh, beautiful uh, part music uh, with glorious choirs. We can he listen to uh, music that is simple, simply sung um, in, a, in a form that you might find in a little village somewhere in the Carpathians if you wanted to. Uh, but in every uh, experience, singing is a very essential part of our rituals. Father Peter, what does it mean for a priest to be bi-ritual? Well, by being bi-ritual, it means that uh, besides the diocese in which you are incarnated, for example, um, I find myself in the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Toronto and Eastern Canada, it means that we're also incarnated or given faculties in a neighboring diocese, and in this case, it is the Roman Catholic Diocese of London, Ontario. Uh, I've received those uh, faculties in 90, 1995, uh, particularly because of my work at schools, uh, so that I was able to say daily mass in the school chapels. Um, as we know, in our system, in our school system, there are almost no priests left and very few sisters. Um, and so it allowed me to say mass every day, and it was in, in that time that I had extended uh, the biritual factors, which allows me to function both in the Roman Rite and in my natural home Rite, which is the uh, Eastern Rite Ukrainian Catholic Church. Can a Latin Rite Catholic attend an Eastern Rite liturgy? Latin Rite Catholics are always welcome to attend an Eastern Rite liturgy in whatever form, whether it's a Byzantine Rite or Armenian Rite or Maronite. Um, all, all Catholics can attend uh, liturgies in other rites within the Catholic Church. And just to be very clear for viewers who may not have this experience, we are talking about the Eastern Catholic rites as opposed to the Orthodox. That's right. Those are the churches which are in communion with, with the Holy Father, uh, which we can uh, see evidently uh, during the liturgy in which we pray in a very particular way for the Holy Father. Uh, that is the indicator that we are in communion, knowing that the, the Catholic Church is really uh, a composite of a whole number of churches, all in union together um, with the Holy Father. Father Peter, how did you and Father Joe get to know one another? Well, that's a, a, a story that takes place over a number of years. Uh, we really came from two different worlds. Uh, and I met Father Joe when I was um, saying Mass on a somewhat regular basis over at St. Josephine's Church in Detroit. And Father, at that time, was a server um, and served uh, Mass for me many times there. And then afterwards uh, expressed a desire to go to the seminary. Uh, and I remember it felt like just yesterday uh, that you went to uh, Pope John the 23rd Seminary in uh, Boston. 
and uh, things have moved very quickly since then. And it's Indeed, been a great yeah. experience to serve Mass for you today uh, here. They grow up so fast, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> Father Joe, any words of wisdom for those among our viewers who might be considering a second career vocation to the priesthood or religious life? Yes, well, you know, the seminary that I went to, Pope St. John the Twenty-Third Seminary in Boston, is designed for second career vocations. And getting to know my fellow seminarians, you find that people get there from all different directions and all different ways. Uh, the most important thing is uh, to discern God's call and what he's calling you to do. And to do that, it just takes prayer and listening to the Lord's voice in the silence of your heart. And uh, particularly as much of that that you can do in front of the Blessed Sacrament and um, be willing to take one small step at a time and just follow where the Lord leads you. Father Joe, thank you so much for celebrating our Mass today and best of luck in your priestly vocation. It was an honor, thank you. My friends Charlie and Ron Parent are on a mission to convince us that Latin is not all that difficult to understand. Ron, I'm going to bring the girls over and show you that Latin is not that hard to learn. It's not hard to understand. If dogs can do it, anybody can do it. The first command is uh, sit, which Lucy does right away. Stella has to be commanded, so sit. Stella, sede. Sede is, is sit in Latin. And then I'm going to command her to turn around. Stella, orate fratus. Dexterum, okay. Dexterum means to give her hand. hand. For Lucy, the same thing. Lucy, come. She likes to sit down. She, she's lazy. Lucy, she sits in orate her. fratus. Dexterum, good girl. Orate fratus is Latin for pray brethren, and it's the part of the Mass that in, uh, in the extraordinary form, the priest is facing God. And at one point in the Mass, he turns to the people and says, Orate Fratris, which means, pray brethren, that our sacrifice will be acceptable. And, and most Catholics will know that part of the Mass, whether it's a Novus Ordo or Latin, an EF Mass. They know that part of the Mass. So it gives us an opportunity to share the Latin Mass, the EF, the Extraordinary Form Mass, through the dogs. It, it gives us an opportunity to share our faith with people where the subject might not ordinarily come up. Stella sede. Stella, orate fratus. Good girl. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of observing many music programs taking shape. One group that's made all the right moves and can be heard performing at special Tridentine Masses all over Metro Detroit and Windsor is the area's oldest extraordinary form choir from the St. Benedict Tridentine community, originally based at Assumption Church in Windsor. The man behind it all is music director Wasim Sarway. Wasim, you're known as the go-to guy for Gregorian chant in the Detroit area. Where did you acquire your expertise in the subject? Well, when I was 18, Alex, I attended my first Extraordinary Form Liturgy, and it really was inspiring. I heard the choir singing Gregorian chant, and it was such a lovely and uplifting, um, uh, uplifting feeling for me, and I just wanted to learn more and more, so I attended many workshops uh, in the area and outside the area, and I just made it one of my projects in life to learn the chant. Speaking of workshops, over the last year you've been speaking at several sacred music conferences on the subject of organ accompaniment for chant. What is so special about your approach to that subject? Well, I think it's a simple approach. I would say it's just to enhance the Gregorian chant, not to take over uh, what is already living it's a living type of music and free and and it's really just to color the chant in in the background so that's kind of my style you also use the organ to help get everybody on key for the responses for the congregation yes uh, it's uh, a knack that I kind of do that I've learned when I went to Paris uh, 
Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, I've noticed the organists, the, the few organists there, they did that this kind of technique where uh, you keep the the priest on pitch for his chants and the congregation as a whole together in unison. So I, I made it a project of mine to do the same thing in this area. Singing on key and starting and stopping in unison are pretty imperative for quality performances. Any trade secrets on how to do that well? There's no secret. It's really just training your voice and having maybe the director work on each person's uh, ability and their strengths and to eliminate the weaknesses. Wasim, you and I have known each other since 1997. We met when the Windsor Tridentine Mass was the only one in this area, and let me assure our viewers, it started out far humbler than what we enjoy now. Absolutely, Alex. Uh, when we started and I met you, it, the, the extraordinary form was in a little high school chapel, and I remember you can count the, you know, the, part, the, the congregation on both of your hands at one point. Um, but let me assure you, uh, with uh, the dedication of all the people involved in, in working together, it has grown to what it is today, and uh, we thank God Almighty for that. Why do you think things have grown so much in such a short span of years? Well, primarily the grace of God. I really believe that uh, there is His work and uh, people worship in different ways and this is one that's been neglected in the last 10 to 20 to 30 years and I think many people want to worship this way and young families have come to our extraordinary forum and it's not just for the elderly. I really think that this can be more of a mainstream type of liturgy. So often I hear other music directors lament a lack of local talent. How have you been able to cultivate such impressive musicians, or do they miraculously appear at Christmas and special events? Well, we're a small town in Windsor, and we have a bigger city across the river, Detroit, Michigan. And basically, all of the talent is local. So there are many churches in the local area that share singers. So that's one thing that I might add. A few of our singers are originally from other churches. This choir sings at the weekly 2 p.m. Latin Mass in Windsor. Is that Mass time a disadvantage? Well, it may be a disadvantage, uh, but from a choir standpoint, you do have more of an advantage by re getting the talent from other churches, say they're mass times are at 10 o'clock and they're all already fi finished their mass times, you may double up, if you will, and have them come at your 2 o'clock mass. It, it could be an advantage as opposed to the disadvantage. I happen to know that some of the singers in this choir already sing at another Latin mass in the morning on Sundays. Absolutely. There is another Latin mass in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, that a couple of the choir members here uh, attend there, and it's a shared wonderful pool of talent, if you will. Not long after we filmed at Assumption Church, the St. Benedict Tridentine community learned it would be relocating to another historic church in town, St. Alphonsus Church. St. Alphonsus dates to the mid-19th century. Several years ago, it underwent a restoration focused on bringing back to life the beautiful artwork adorning the ceiling and sanctuary. There's even an effigy and relics of a third century Roman martyr, St. Tegulus, underneath one of the side altars. We just finished an extraordinary form mass here at St. Alphonsus. Now the St. Benedict Choir is going to sing for us Franz Bibel's Ave Maria. Angelus Domini, nun se habit Maria, et concepit Spiritus Sancto. Stay. 
our next episode, we'll cross the river to Detroit, where we'll stop by Holy Redeemer, a church that replicates the grandeur and appearance of a Vatican Basilica. We'll tour the immaculately restored St. Hyacinth Church in Poletown. We'll learn how lay people can go about starting a Latin Mass community. We'll meet a bishop who has embraced the celebration of the extraordinary form. And we'll talk with a man who has composed chant sheets to help priests sing the traditional Mass. There's more information about every place and person we visit on our website, ExtraordinaryFaith.tv. Please contact us there and like us on Facebook where you can leave questions or comments. Thanks for sharing our ride through Windsor today and join us on the other side of the bridge next time as we journey through Michigan's Catholic traditions here on Extraordinary Faith.